Welcome to another video lecture on topic D1.2 protein synthesis. This is our additional higher level content. So our SL friends, you are welcome to keep listening, um, but you will not be assessed on this content. Higher level peeps, here we go. Our guiding questions are still, how does a cell produce a sequence of amino acids from a sequence of DNA bases? And how is the reliability of protein synthesis ensured? Our objectives, we're going to outline the functions of promoter and terminator regions. We're going to talk about transcription factors. We're going to talk about the directionality of transcription and translation. We're going to outline the processing of messenger RNA, including the consequences of alternative splicing of that messenger RNA. We're going to go through the steps of translation one more time, talk about post-translational modifications of the polypeptides that are formed during translation, and then we're going to talk about the functions of proteasomes. Remember that gene expression, turning on and turning off specific genes, involves transcription and translation. Transcription is the process of using a DNA code to produce a piece of messenger RNA. And then in translation, we use that messenger RNA to code for a protein. The sum of all of our genes is a genome. The sum of all of our proteins is a proteome. And the sum of all of that messenger RNA transcripts that we make is a transcriptome. In transcription, we're going to start at a promoter region. So RNA polymerase, that enzyme that carries out pretty much all of the processes involved in transcription, will bind to our DNA a little bit ahead, or we call it upstream, upstream of the gene that's going to be transcribed at a promoter region. These promoter regions simply help to attract the RNA polymerase so that transcription can occur on these specific genes. What's pretty cool about these promoter regions, they tend to have a lot of thymines and adenines. So sometimes we'll refer to them as TATA boxes, um, just because there are these chunks of lots of thymines and adenines in the promoter regions. That promoter region all by itself isn't quite enough to attract the RNA polymerase, get it to bind. We also have lots of transcription factors that will bind, um, and these just help us to regulate transcription. So sometimes we have factors that will repress transcription. Sometimes we have factors that will promote transcription. These Extra molecules, again, just help us to regulate when we activate genes, when we deactivate genes. And then, of course, when we activate them, RNA polymerase can bind to the promoter region and then transcribe the gene that we're looking at. Super cool thing about RNA polymerase, it does not need any help to open up the DNA double helix. RNA polymerase all by itself can unwind the DNA. So we've got RNA polymerase here, and it is forming the super cool thing called the transcription bubble. So we open up the DNA for only a very short amount of time, just long enough to use that template strand to make some messenger RNA. And then we will rewind that DNA as the polymerase slides along the gene. Just like we have directionality in DNA replication, we also have that directionality in transcription, and happily, it's the same directionality. So we are still going from a five prime to three prime direction, and the reason is the same. We have those phosphate groups attached to carbon number five in our RNA nucleotides, and then the RNA polymerase molecule will use those energy stores in the phosphate groups to bind together each of those nucleotides in the growing strand of messenger RNA. So we're going five prime to three prime because the five prime end of the new RNA nucleotide has all that energy from those phosphate groups that's used to bind it to the three prime end of the growing strand. And similarly, we have directionality in translation. Remember that translation is using that messenger RNA transcript to code for a strand of amino acids, that polypeptide chain. We are again going to move in that five prime to three prime direction. So the ribosome will slide along the messenger RNA from its five prime end to its three prime end. 
Once that messenger RNA transcript is produced, us eukaryotes will process it, uh, do some extra super cool things to it. One of those things is called splicing. This does not happen in prokaryotes, only in us eukaryotes. In splicing, what we do is literally chop up the messenger RNA. We call that not yet mature messenger RNA, pre or primary messenger RNA. We chop it up with these clusters of SNRNPs uh, that collectively are known as a spliceosome. So spliceosome uh, is that chunk of all these SNRNPs. SNRNP stands for small nuclear ribo nucleoproteins, small nuclear ribonuclear proteins. And again, together they form what we call a spliceosome. It binds to this piece of the messenger RNA that we refer to as an intron, intron. And then that intron literally gets snipped or spliced out of that piece of messenger RNA. That intron is going to stay in the nucleus and it gets recycled into uh, those RNA nucleotides and can be used in the next round of transcription. What is left are these pieces known as exons. Those exons are then bound together into our mature piece of messenger RNA. One of the benefits of this splicing of messenger RNA is that we can actually chop up and glue together these exons in different ways. We call that alternative splicing. Here we are showing our piece of DNA, that gene, and there are five exons, and that messenger RNA is going to have all five of those pieces. But when I make my mature messenger RNA, some of those exons become introns. So this guy has only one and three and five. So these guys become introns for this first protein, which only has amino acid polypeptide chains produced from those three exons, whereas this protein is entirely different because it doesn't have number one, instead it has number two, which means that this becomes the intron. This is now an exon. The introns stay in the nucleus. The exons exit the nucleus and go out to the ribosome to be coded into proteins. We can have one single gene that codes for multiple different kinds of proteins. One gene, many proteins. What's crazy cool, as humans, we think that we've got about 25,000 genes, but our proteome is like 100,000 proteins. And that is due in large part to this alternative splicing. One super interesting example of a gene that goes through uh, alternative splicing is the troponin gene. Troponin is a um, protein that is involved in muscle contraction. That's what this image is showing. We have troponin bound to this other protein complex called tropomyosin. When calcium is involved, there are these shape changes and that frees up the myosin binding site on action and that allows for muscles to contract, again, including heart muscle. When we get to our unit on physiology, we will talk about this a lot, a lot. But for now, know that troponin is involved in muscle contraction, including heart muscle contraction. We have this gene that codes for troponin. We have just this one troponin gene. But you can imagine that as we develop from embryo to fetus to infant uh, to then adult, our hearts are different. Our hearts have different functions. And so that heart muscle needs to contract in different ways. This troponin gene, this single gene, can result in the production of different kinds of troponin the troponin that we need in fetal development, the, the troponin that we need when we're adults. And so this alternative splicing of troponin leads to different kinds of troponin protein that allows for our heart muscle to contract in different ways as we develop from fetus to infant to adult. And one last little word on our processing of messenger RNA before we start talking about translation using that messenger RNA to make some polypeptide chains. So we add a poly A tail, literally many adenines to the three prime end, um, and we call that a tail 
Its job is to protect the important parts of the messenger RNA, the coding regions of the messenger RNA from being degraded by enzymes that are in the cytoplasm. We also add a five prime cap. So to the five prime end of our messenger RNA strand, we're going to add this super cool special um, guanine nucleotide. It's it's got an extra methyl group, it's got some extra phosphate groups, and this also just allows for the stabilization, the protection of the messenger RNA strand so that we can actually translate it into a polypeptide before it starts to fall apart. And now we finally come to translation, the process of using that mature messenger RNA to produce a strand of amino acids, that polypeptide chain. Here we have our messenger RNA. Here we have what is known as our initiator, initiator transfer RNA, which is going to initiate the whole entire process. So the initiator RNA is going to bind to the small subunit of a ribosome. And then together, the ribosome small subunit and the initiator transfer RNA are going to slide along the messenger RNA until they run into the start codon. So here we have the start codon. Here we have the start anticodon. This transfer RNA is bound to the amino acid methionine. Methionine is our start amino acid. Once we have this initiator transfer RNA bound to the start codon, then the large subunit of the ribosome will click into place. This initiator transfer RNA is now going to be in what we call the P site of that large subunit of the ribosome. A second transfer RNA is going to slide into the A site, and then the ribosome is going to move methionine amino acid over to phenylalanine in this example. The ribosome is going to catalyze the formation of a peptide bond between those two amino acids. This initiator transfer RNA is now going to slide over to the E site and exit. The amino acid phenylalanine, amino acid methionine that are bound to the second transfer RNA. All together, they're going to slide into the middle, into the P site. And then a third amino acid is going to come into the A site, and then the whole thing will happen all over again. And here we can kind of see these steps involved in translation. We have our initiator transfer RNA in the P site. Here comes our A site. The ribosome is going to slide these amino acids over here. And now I have amino acids on the A site transfer RNA. The initiator transfer RNA that was in the P site slides over to the E site and then it exits. The A site guy is going to slide into the P site and then we'll add in another transfer RNA at the A site with another amino acid. The ribosome will transfer those amino acids over to the A site, transfer RNA's amino acid, and then slide and then slide. And we keep going until we get to the terminator sequence at which point the ribosome will release from the messenger RNA and transcription will be done. But wait, we're not done yet. So just like we modify our messenger RNA with the splicing and the poly A tail, we also modify a lot of our polypeptide chains before they become functional proteins. One of the things that we do is chop off methionine, methionine, that start amino acid that's at the amino terminal or five prime end of our polypeptide chain. We might also phosphorylate, that means add some phosphate groups to some of the side chains along our polypeptide chain. We can also glycosylate, that means add some carbohydrate or glucose pieces also to those R groups, those side chains of our amino acids along the polypeptide chain. We might chop out whole entire pieces. We can glue together separate polypeptide chains. We definitely have lots of folding going on. So we make that tertiary structure, that three-dimensional folding quaternary structure if we have multiple polypeptide chains. And if I have a conjugated protein, where that conjugated proteins have those extra pieces known as prosthetic groups. 
if I have a conjugated protein, then we need to add in those prosthetic groups. An example of a conjugated protein, of course, is hemoglobin. It's our favorite example. The prosthetic groups are those heme groups that have the iron that help us transport oxygen on our red blood cells around our bodies. This particular example is insulin. Insulin is not a conjugated protein, so I don't have to worry about adding our prosthetic groups, but there is a lot of other modification that goes into getting us from this pre-pro-insulin polypeptide chain to functional insulin protein. One of the things that we do is chop off not just the methionine, but an entire chunk of amino acids known as the signal sequence or the signal peptide. So we chop off all that stuff. It's gone. We're also going to excise, excise or remove this chain C from the polypeptide chain that takes us from pre-pro-insulin to pro-insulin, finally to actual insulin. We're going to bind those two chains that remain, chain B and chain A, bind them together with some disulfide bridges and voila, we finally have mature and functional insulin. That insulin that we just made, I don't necessarily want it to continue regulating my blood sugar levels. What if I actually need to raise my blood sugar? I don't want insulin continuing to lower. So we have these super cool things called proteasomes that help us to digest breakdown proteins in our cells. We can then recycle those amino acids and use them to build new proteins in another round of translation. Proteasomes also will break down proteins that are denatured or otherwise starting to fall apart. Um, we don't want broken proteins rolling around our cells. We want to clean up those messes. So how proteasomes work, it's pretty cool. So the protein actually will wind its way down this tube that is the proteasome. It's going to chop up that protein um, first into little pieces of peptides, and then those peptides get broken down into individual amino acids. And then, of course, those individual amino acids, because we are amazing recycling centers, can get reused to build new proteins on another day. And on that note, my friends, we have arrived at the end of our video lecture on additional higher level content of protein synthesis. We talked about promoter regions and terminator regions on genes. We talked about transcription factors. All of these help to regulate gene expression. We only activate the genes, transcribe the genes that we want to turn on. We talked about the directionality of transcription and translation. We do love A5 prime to three prime direction. We talked about how we can process our messenger RNA. We can splice it. We can add poly A tails and five prime caps. We can alternatively splice our messenger RNA and then get lots of different proteins from the same mRNA transcript. We talked about the steps of translation. We have the initiator transfer RNA, and then we have the elongation of our polypeptide chain until we get to that stop codon. Before we have functional proteins, we have to post-translationally modify those polypeptide chains. We chop off the methionine. We might chop out some other chains. We glue them together, add some prosthetic groups. And when our proteins have come to the ends of their lifetimes, we have our proteasomes that chop up those proteins back down into amino acids so that we can do the whole thing all over again. Great work today.